Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture. My name is Sally Shortall. I work in the university and I co-chaired the Public Insights Committee. Tonight, I'm absolutely delighted that we're welcoming Tim Harford to uh, give us our lecture. And the title of the lecture is How to Make the World Add Up. I will be back after Tim's lecture for a live Q&A with uh, Tim. If you would like to ask a question, please use the chat function on your screen, or you can tweet us at Insights NCL. If you want to tweet about the event while it's on, please use hashtag uh, Insights NCL. So as well as having the pleasure of chairing uh, tonight's event, it's also my pleasure to introduce Tim Harford who, as I'm sure you already know, is an extremely well-known economist, journalist, and broadcaster. He is the author of How to Make the World Add Up, Messy, and The Million Selling, The Undercover Economist. He's a senior writer at the Financial Times and the presenter of BBC Radio's More or Less, How to Vaccinate the World, and 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, as well as the podcast, Cautionary Tales. Tim was made an OBE for services to improving economic understanding in the New Year's Honours of 2019. He is a world recognised evangelist for the power of economics. And here he is now to tell us how to make the world add up. All of my family are very big fans, so I'm really looking forward to the lecture and I look forward to seeing you afterwards for the live questions and answers. So over to you, Tim. Well, thank you very much, Sally. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks for your patience for the last 30 seconds while we pressed all the right buttons and, and got all the, the show on the road. Um, I want to begin by telling you a story. And uh, at first, it might seem like a story that doesn't have much to do with the 21st century. But I, I think before long, the relevance will become all too clear. But the story begins in 1936 in Monaco in a villa owned by uh, one of the world's great art critics, a man called Abraham Bradius. Uh, and Bradius was uh, into his 80s. He was, uh, had been worshipped for his mastery of Dutch interiors, painters, uh, Rembrandt, Vermeer, uh, and he was enjoying something of a swan song towards the end of his life. He just published a highly respected uh, a book about the works of Rembrandt, uh, and during which he'd, he'd unmasked various forgeries and identified which works really belonged to the old master. And it was at, at this moment in his career that he was approached by a former member of parliament, of the Dutch parliament, a charming lawyer called Gerard Bone. And Gerard Bone had a fascinating story for Bradius. Uh, he explained to him that uh, he had made contact with a family of, um, uh, of, of Dutch people who lived in Italy under Mussolini's fascist dictatorship. They were trying to escape, they were trying to get to America. And in order to try to raise money for that escape, um, these Dutch anti-fascists uh, were hoping to sell a painting that they had 
And um, they'd shown the painting to Gerard Bone, and Gerard Bone wondered if it might be worth rather more than they suspected. And so he'd brought it to Abraham Bradius to hear Abraham Bradius's view. Now, when Bradius carefully unpacked this huge packing case with this old canvas stretched over to 17th century uh, frame, when he looked at the picture, he was spellbound. He wrote in a magazine article shortly afterwards, when I first saw this painting, I had difficulty controlling my emotion. He, he used the Dutch word ongerept, which means almost virginally pure and uncorrupted and, and untouched. He said, it is a wonderful moment in the life of a lover of art when he finds himself suddenly confronted with a hitherto unknown painting by a great master, the masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer of Delft, quite different from all his other paintings, yet every inch of Vermeer. Well, I don't think I'm spoiling too much to tell you right now that it was not of Amir. That Abraham Bradius, one of the world's greatest art critics, had fallen for a forgery. Not just any forgery, but a, a crude forgery. A forgery that shouldn't have taken in somebody of his caliber. Bradius was nicknamed the Pope because of his authority and respect and the way that his judgments carried so much weight. And when Bradius said that this painting uh, was of Amir, the Dutch art world, indeed the whole art world, accepted Bradius's judgment. People scrambled to get hold of this painting. It, pretty soon it was purchased for a large amount of money and was, <clears throat> excuse me, was hanging in the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam. Now, I want to talk about this story, uh, not because I'm fascinated by the history of art, although you know, I think the history of art is, is kind of interesting. I'm fascinated by this story because I think that any one of us, well, if you catch us the wrong moment, any one of us could be Abraham Bradius. We can learn all the skills, all the expertise that anybody can imagine, and we can still be wrong. Like catastrophically wrong, foolishly wrong, if, as Bradius did, we let our emotions get away from us. And it's that that I want to talk about. So there was a study done of a related uh, problem. Um, about 10 years ago, the University of Oxford, a behavioural economist called Guy Mayras, uh, got people into his laboratory and he randomized them. So half of them were, were given the role of farmers and half of them were given the role of bakers. And all these people were shown graphs showing you know, sort of a, a line going up and down, up and down, up and down. And they were told this line is a price. It's the price of wheat. Now, as it happens, the, well, the graphs weren't the price of wheat. The graphs were just taken from... The, uh, the stock market, but it doesn't matter. Um, they're shown these graphs, bouncing up and down, bouncing up and down. And they were told, this is the price of wheat. And if you're able to forecast what this price is going to do next, I'll give you a cash prize. The more accurate your forecast, the more money you'll get. But he also said to the the farmers, remember, randomly assigned, these are just people who are participating in a laboratory experiment. He said to the ones who've been given the role of farmer, um, you're a farmer, so um, if the price of wheat is high, you'll get more money. So as well as the cash bonus for making an accurate forecast, I'll also give you money if the price of wheat happens to be high. Uh, and the other group, the bakers, were told, well, you're the bakers, so obviously you want wheat to be cheap because it's an input to bread. And so same thing. The lower the price of wheat, the more money I'll give you. And also, separately, I'll give you money if you make an accurate forecast of the price of wheat. Now, 
What Mayraz found was not, I think, what you'd expect. What you'd expect is people are going to try and make the most accurate forecast because they're being paid to make the most accurate forecast. But what instead happened is that the farmers systematically predicted that the price of wheat would be high, and the bakers systematically predicted that the price of wheat would be low. This is wishful thinking in its purest form, people systematically forecasting what they hope will be true. Now, Benjamin Franklin, a great American scientist and uh, founding father, uh, once said, so convenient a thing it is to be a reasonable creature, since it enables us to find or make a reason for everything one has a mind to. Basically, we're rational, but we don't always use that rationality to solve problems. Sometimes we use that rationality to find excuses to believe whatever it is that we want to believe. I mean, that is what Guy Mayraz's subjects were doing. They were finding reasons to believe that the price of wheat would move in the way that they wanted the price of wheat to move. But surely when we're coming to one of the world's great experts, Surely this uh, remained undetected. But the truth came to light in 1945, nine years after Abraham Bradius first saw the painting and first said that it was the masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer of Delft. 1945, of course, was the end of the Second World War. The Netherlands had been occupied by Nazi Germany. And in May 1945, with the, the war in Europe coming to an end, two Allied officers knocked on the door of 321 Kaisersgracht, uh, which is a, a fine townhouse in one of the most desirable streets in Amsterdam. It was opened by a charismatic little man with you know, bulging jowls and a little moustache and silvering hair called Han van Meegeren. Now, Han van Meegeren had uh, made a lot of money as an art dealer, and possibly slightly too much money. Uh, the Allied officers were keen to know how it was that he had not just this mansion, but another one on the same street, and indeed a portfolio of property all across Amsterdam. Uh, and in particular, they wanted to know about his art collection, because the Allies had found uh, Hermann Goering's collection of looted art from across Europe. Hermann Goering, Hitler's number two, one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany, had this vast hall of artwork that he had basically stolen from occupied territories. And in Hermann Goering's hall of artwork, uh, was a painting by Vermeer. And the Nazis, being the Nazis, had kept the receipts, and the trail of transactions led all the way back to Han von Meegeren. So these Allied officers wanted to know how it was that von Meegeren had got hold of Vermeer and why he had sold a priceless Dutch treasure to the Nazis. This was a crime for which he could hang. And Van Meegeren was arrested. He was marched at gunpoint across Amsterdam. And after days of questioning, he finally cracked. He said, you fools, you think I sold a Vermeer to Goering, that fat fool? It's not a Vermeer. It's a Van Meegeren. I painted it myself. Now, this confession sent shockwaves through the Dutch art world. I mean, Christ at Emmaus, the first painting that Bradius had seen and authenticated, had been sold for the equivalent of £10 million in today's money to the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam. And after that painting had been exhibited and had become the centrepiece of this museum, other paintings in a similar style emerged, and since they were clearly by the same artist as the one that painted the Vermeer in the, the Boymans, they were also authenticated as Vermeers. The total sums of money involved were perhaps £100 million in, in today's terms, 
And this is a monumental fraud. And it's a fraud that really should have strained credulity. And Vermeer is a hugely respected artist, but not much is known about his life. Not many of his paintings survive, maybe 30. And the sudden discovery of another five or six Vermeers in just a couple of years, well, eyebrows should have been raised, but apparently they weren't. So why not? Well, the answer is very simple. Um, Van Meegeren understood something really important about human nature. It's that sometimes we want to be fooled. Let me take a moment to show you the painting in question. This, of course, is the cover of my book, How to Make the World Add Up, Excellent Christmas Present. This is the painting. This is Christ to Timaeus. This is the painting that cast a spell over Abraham Bradius. Now, when you look at it, I mean, I don't know much about art, but um, there are a few questions immediately arise. So um, the guy in yellow, what's going on with his arm? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'm allergic to this, this painting. Um, what's going on with his arm? What's happening at his elbow? It looks like he's got a fake arm in his sleeve that's attached to the table. What's going on with the eyelashes? Like those, those, those um, not the eyelashes, the eyelids. Those are kind of odd eyelids. Now, it seems a bit odd to say that this is a masterpiece of uh, Johannes Vermeer. Even odder when I actually show you a Vermeer. That is a Vermeer. Now, there are, there are some superficial similarities. For example, the, the color palette, the yellows and the blues, they look kind of similar. You've got a window with light from the left. But really, these are not very similar paintings. This is a woman reading a letter. Look at the details on this painting. Look at the way that he's realized the, the fabric and the studs on that chair. The sort of the ambiguity is the woman, maybe she's pregnant. Who's the letter from? You know, her, her absent husband, perhaps. There's a sense that she's, she's holding her breath. And there's this, this palpable tension in the painting. It's truly a masterpiece. And look again, Christ of Emmaus, it's, it's dour and it's flat by comparison. There's only really no reason to look at this painting and to say, yes, that is a Vermeer masterpiece. So what is going on? What happened? Well, I think what makes the, this a puzzling question is that when you and I look at these two paintings, now we don't, I don't know much about art, but I just look at that, the, the Christ of Timaeus painting and I think to myself, doesn't look like a Vermeer. I mean, I don't know much, but it just doesn't look like a Vermeer. So how was it that Abraham Bradius managed to convince himself that it was? Well, there's a, a number of recent studies of this kind of phenomenon have been conducted. And uh, what they tend to find is that motivated reasoning is very powerful. Motivated reasoning is, is this process of trying to reach a particular conclusion. It's wishful thinking, effectively. Um, motivated reasoning is powerful. Now, having more knowledge, having more information, having more expertise is not necessarily a defense. If you are determined to reach a particular conclusion, more facts, more expertise, more information, that's just like more ammunition. You've got more ways to get to where you basically want to go. So for example, 15 years ago, two political scientists called uh, Charles Tabor and Milton Lodge um, asked people to uh, evaluate, critically evaluate certain um, politically sensitive uh, propositions. So asking people to think about things like the death penalty, abortion rights, um, capital punishment, uh, um, the capital punishment for uh, under 18s. These things are slightly controversial in the States for some reason. Um, and what they found was that um, 
when people were asked to evaluate uh, questions and evaluate arguments about these controversial topics, um, they were you know, very partisan in the way that they processed information. So they're very, very quick to find fault with uh, arguments that reached the wrong conclusion, that reached a conclusion that was the opposite of what they wanted to, to reach. But what Tabor and Lodge found was the more information you gave people, the more biased their reasoning became. Uh, and the more expert people were, the more they knew about politics, the more biased their reasoning became. It really was as though the expertise was just extra fuel for this journey that they wanted to make all along. They wanted to reach a particular conclusion. And if they have more facts, if they have more expertise, they're better able to reach that conclusion. Now, you can see this absolutely at work in Abraham Bradius's reasoning about Christ at Emmaus. So when you or I see Christ at Emmaus, we say, eh, doesn't look like a great painting. But when Bradius saw it, he saw all sorts of clues to back up his theory that maybe it was a real Vermeer. So Bradius had long had a particular theory about Vermeer, about Vermeer's career, about his influences. There's this big gap in the middle of Vermeer's painting, um, not a literal gap in the middle of the painting, but in his, um, in his CV, he has a couple of early biblical paintings. And then there's about 10 years where he doesn't, none of his paintings survive. And then he has these beautiful interiors late in his career for, for which he's famous. So Bradius had this theory that he must have been painting during the 10 years and none of those paintings survive. And that maybe those paintings have a biblical theme because his early paintings have a biblical theme, but maybe they're more like his later interiors, but with a biblical theme. And also Vermeer got better. So why did he get better? So Bradius had this theory that maybe he'd traveled to Italy. Maybe he'd seen the paintings of Caravaggio, great Italian painter, that um, maybe those paintings had influenced his later compositions. So Bradius had written about all of this stuff. Han van Meegren could be perfectly capable of reading what Bradius wrote. And so he painted Christ at Emmaus as this kind of trap. So it, it perfectly fulfills Abraham Bradius's theory. You know, it's, it's, it's an interior, but it's biblical theme. It's, it's a theme that Caravaggio himself painted. He painted the same scene. Um, so when Bradius saw the painting, he wasn't seeing a painting that might or might not be a Vermeer. He was seeing proof that his theory was correct. He was seeing, he was seeing proof that he'd been right all along. Now, when he looked at this, this canvas, he, the first thing he did was flip it over, look at the back. Now, any expert can tell if a, a painting is painted on a 19th century canvas when it's supposed to be a 17th century painting. But this was a 17th century canvas because Van Meegeren had painted on a 17th century canvas. So immediately, evidence that the theory was true. It had a 17th century jug in it, this white water jug, very distinctive. Um, Van Meegeren owned a 17th century antique. Again, Bradius is able to identify, oh, that that jug is from the 17th century in the middle of a biblical painting. So obviously it's supposed to be 2000 years old. Um, that is a telling um, sort of mistake that this is exactly the kind of mistake that Vermeer himself would make. But Van Meegeren, of course, was, was well ahead of him. Van Meegeren had gone to a London art shop and bought five years supply, like the entire supply of the entire shop for five years of lapis lazuli paint. It's a very expensive blue paint. It's the blue paint that Vermeer used that no modern painter would use because it's too expensive. So he found all of these ways to imitate the way that Vermeer painted the materials, the canvas, everything. What he hadn't done was paint a painting that looked like Vermeer. So when Bradius saw this, he saw a dozen reasons to believe his theory and, and those reasons added up to what enough to overturn the one big reason that should have convinced him this is a rotten forgery, which is that the painting doesn't look like anything Vermeer ever painted. There, there was one other thing. Van Meegeren had found a way to harden the oil painting uh, in 
in this uh, piece. So oil paint takes about 50 years to fully dry, to fully harden. If you take a little bit of alcohol and put it on a cotton swab and you rub it against the painting, it'll come away with a bit of pigment unless the paint is at least 50 years old. Well, Van Meegeren had found a way to mix oil paints with Bakelite, an early industrial plastic. And so the paint was absolutely rock solid. So again, Bradius saw this and said, this is an old painting. It can't possibly be a modern forgery. But of course it was. And Bradius should have known that. In the article where he said he had difficulty controlling his emotion, he also said that this was quite different from Vermeer's other paintings, yet every inch of Vermeer. Of course, the fact that it was quite different from Vermeer's paintings should have been a clue. It should have been the indication that something was amiss. But Radius, of course, had difficulty controlling his emotion. So look, why, why am I so interested in this case? I'm interested in this case because for the last 15 years, I've been presenting a radio show about numbers, about statistics, about the way they're presented, about the way we describe them, about the way politicians use them. And as part of that, a lot of what we do is to, is to fact check. You know, we look at numbers and we say, well, is this true or is this not? What does this number really mean? Where does it come from? And you know, something I've noticed over the last five years or so is that a lot of people don't care. It's not that they're not interested in numbers. They're interested in numbers. The numbers are important. The numbers tell us important things about the world. It's just people have picked their side. You know, whatever the debate, whatever the, the political division, People have picked their side. You can see it in Brexit. You can see it in conventional politics, Tory versus Labour. You can see it on climate change. You can see it in COVID denialism. People pick their side. And once they've picked their side, they become emotionally committed to a particular point of view. And once they're emotionally committed to a particular point of view, it doesn't matter what the numbers say. And it doesn't matter how much extra information, how much extra expertise or technical training I try to give people doesn't work. And so when I wrote my book, How to Make the World Add Up, it's got technical ideas in there. It's got advice as to how to think about numbers. But I begin the book with the story of Abraham Bradius and Han van Meegeren, the forger. Because there's no way I could possibly tell you as much about statistics as Abraham Bradius already knew about Dutch art and it didn't help him. I'm not saying that expertise isn't helpful. I'm not saying that knowledge is pointless. It's incredibly helpful. It's incredibly valuable, but you have to use it in the right way. And that means getting control of your own emotional reaction, understanding your own filters, preconceptions, and biases. And so the very first piece of advice I give people when they're encountering a headline, when they're encountering a statistic, you know, a clip on YouTube, something on Facebook or TikTok, whatever. And, and they're trying to figure out what it means. Is it true? The first thing I say is notice your own emotional reaction. As Darth Vader once said, search your feelings. And just ask yourself, is this making me feel angry or defensive or kind of smug? Oh yeah, I, I, I expected that. I knew that would happen. Joyful vindicated. I want to tell people I was right all along. Whatever it is, whatever the emotion is, just notice the emotion. And simply noticing the emotion and noticing the fact that this headline or this social media post is triggering that emotion in you. Immediately, you start to be a little calmer and you start to think a little bit more clearly. And that's the most important piece of advice I can give you. And there's, there's more. I would say it's really useful to think seriously about opposing points of view. So when, when you encounter somebody you disagree with, rather than trying to convince them they're wrong, or rather, which is much more likely, rather than trying to convince all your friends that they're evil, just try and engage for a moment with what they're saying. Why do they, th why do they think that? Does it, does it make any sense? Does it usefully challenge my views? It might not do. It might just be trolls. It might just be nonsense. But it's worth pausing and, and taking a little moment to think about that. I mean, one of the reasons why 
diversity is so important is because diversity forces us to rethink the world. And then we come out of our, our insular communities and we meet people from different parts of the world with different views, with different experiences, different sexualities, different genders, different ages, different politics. And they change us for the better because we start to realize the world is a bit more complex and a bit more interesting than we thought. And the most important piece of advice I can give you, the most important piece of advice of all, is to keep on being curious, is not to treat new information, a headline, a statistic, as a weapon in an argument. I can use this to, to beat somebody, to, to convince somebody, or to convince my friends that I'm smart. Instead, to see new information as just what it is, new information, new facts about the world something that might change your view. Be curious, be genuinely curious. And that, that's a tremendous antidote to political polarization. But I'm not pretending for a moment that this is easy because we're, we're emotional creatures, we're political creatures, we're tribal creatures. We do pick sides. I've got sides, I've got emotions, all of us have. And if we didn't, we wouldn't, I think, be fully human. But that means we will always be slightly vulnerable to the con man who knows how to give us what we want, or at least what we think we want. Han von Megren was uh, put on trial in 1947, and he was a hero. He'd given the Dutch people a new story. That too many of the Dutch had collaborated with Nazis Terrible things had been done by Dutch collaborators. The, the people of Amsterdam had been nearly starving in the, the previous winter. They had a really hard time. They were ashamed of what many people in the Netherlands had done. And Van Meegeren was able to give them this different story about somebody who fooled the Nazis, somebody who got one over on Hitler and Goering, sold them a fake and told them it was a Vermeer, and made a folk hero out of him. And of course, this idea was tested in court. You know, he told the judge that, um, oh, the, the money that he made just gave him nothing but trouble, um, which is pretty big talk from somebody who owned mansions all over Amsterdam and had you know, drug and sex parties while the rest of Amsterdam was starving. But people seemed to lap it up. The judge said, well, you know, why did you paint these paintings? And Van Meegeren said, oh, I just wanted to prove that I could do it. I wanted to prove the foolish art critics wrong and demonstrate my own capacities as, as an artist. The judge said, well, why did you sell them for such high prices? Van Meegeren said, if I'd sold them for low prices, everybody would have known they weren't real Vermeers. And of course, the courtroom was laughing. When he left the court, he was a folk hero. The hard truth about Van Meegeren, though, is he was a Nazi. He was highly sympathetic to the Nazis. He published anti-Semitic poetry, anti-Semitic drawings. He was friends with senior Nazis. That's how he got the introduction to Goering's circle. And in Hitler's private library, there's a, a copy of a really evil anti-Semitic book, luxurious one, created and illustrated and published by Van Meegeren and dedicated to my beloved Führer in grateful tribute, signed Han van Meegeren. You might think to yourself, if only they'd found that book before the trial, people would have seen the truth. They would have seen what a horrible man this was, that he was a Nazi, not a hero. But I'm afraid the truth is they did find the book before the trial. And Van Meegeren was able to wave it away, just, oh, it's, it's just my political enemies. Uh, don't, don't pay any attention to it. Um, somebody else must have written that dedication. It's all fake news. Uh, in the modern world, he would probably have said, that's not my voice you can hear on the tape. He waved it away and they, they didn't want to hear. The Dutch didn't want to hear about Van Meegeren being a Nazi because what they really wanted was the story of the hero, this kind of Robin Hood character who'd finally had got one over 
on the Nazis. Van Meegren was given a short prison sentence for forgery, he died of a heart attack before he ever served a day in prison. And an opinion poll put him as uh, just behind the prime minister, the most popular man in the country. Uh, there was even talk of putting up a statue. The thing is, our emotions are an incredibly powerful guide to what we believe. And Van Meegren understood people's emotions. Abraham Bradius wanted to discover one last Vermeer. The Dutch people wanted a hero. And Han van Meegren knew exactly how to give people what they wanted. Thanks very much for listening. Very happy to take questions about statistics, wishful thinking, economics, anything you want to talk about. But thanks so much for tuning in. Tim, thanks so much for a fascinating um, talk. I have quite a few questions, but I'm not going to abuse chair's privilege at this point. So I'm going to go to the first question I can see in our chat, and it's coming from Keith. And he asks, in your experience, are people more or less likely to trust statistics shared via social media? Or do people simply choose to focus on figures that support their own views? Uh, it's a really good question. So I think the thing about social media, uh, first of all, um, stuff tends to be shared if it's got emotional resonance. So you know, all kinds of stuff goes on social media, but the stuff you see, you see because uh, it got people upset or joyful or that's why there's so many cat videos. I mean, the internet does contain things other than cat videos, but cat videos get shared. So um, if you see it on social media, it's more likely to be uh, emotionally salient and to stir emotions in you. And those emotions might you know, make it you know, more likely you'll believe something you shouldn't, or alternatively, that you'll disbelieve or you'll reject something that you should. And it's worth pointing out, I think disbelief is just as powerful as, and just as problematic as belief. Um, you know, we think about people believing all kinds of, of stupid things, but actually people disbelieve all kinds of stupid things as well. And that, that's a problem. So that's one thing that's going on with social media. Second thing is people are often consuming social media on a really small screen. That seems like it wouldn't make a lot of difference, but it, it strips facts of context. So people are missing kind of uh, extra cues as to whether this is a reliable source or not. And that turns out to be a problem. And the third thing is, um, it's kind of distracting. There's lots going on. You're looking at your phone. There's other stuff going on around you, other, other notifications. Um, and the evidence suggests that when people are distracted, they find it hard to focus on what's true and what's not. And very often, you, I mean, you, we can see the experimental data on this, but you have stuff that comes in. People think, oh, that's interesting and that sounds right, and they'll just share it. And then if you, if you come to them and say, well, is that, do you think that's true? And people will go, oh yeah, that can't be true. That's just nonsense. But they didn't, they didn't think about it. They didn't focus on it. They just passed it on. So those are reasons why social media can, you know, can lead us astray. Um, but I mean, there's nothing magic about social media always being awful. Epidemiology Twitter is brilliant. There are some great people, really, really good analysis on social media. And of course, conventional media is, 
full of nonsense as well as good reporting as well. But those are the reasons why it can be a problem. Great, thank you. So the next question is from Sarah and she asks, in your new book, you explain we should ask who is missing from the data we're being shown and whether our conclusions might differ if they were included. Can it ever be justified for an honest and greater purpose to intentionally omit certain groups' stats from data? Um, that's a really interesting question. So the just to give some context to people who haven't read the book, thanks for reading the book, by the way. Um, so uh, there are various reasons why people might be missing from, from data, but often because uh, experimenters haven't bothered to you know, to invite people into the laboratory or uh, census takers find it difficult to meet, to, to reach certain kinds of people, or sometimes the questions aren't very well designed. Um, so uh, one re really good book on the subject is Caroline Criado Perez's Invisible Women, which is all about how um, uh, women are often omitted from scientific studies or questions that are being asked um, aren't relevant to, uh, to many women. Um, so, you know, this is a problem. This is, I mean, this is a problem of justice. But it's also a problem of analysis. Like you're going to make mistakes if there are people missing from your um, from your study. And you know, it, it could be, for example, you uh, have an opinion poll in 2016, and uh, you're trying to figure out who's going to win the U.S. presidential election, and you're just systematically less likely to get hold of Trump sympathizers than Clinton sympathizers. And hey, presto, you just misforecast the election and Trump wins. Um, so this is this is serious. So could it ever be ethical to, to deliberately miss people out? Um, I mean, I can't think of an, an example where you would want to do that. Maybe there is one that I haven't fully um, imagined. It, it can be ethical to, um, to deliberately obscure people for anonymity reasons. And that's a really interesting discussion as to how that works. But I can't think of an example where you would want to just say, well, we're just not going to include that, that group. Um, but maybe that's a failure of my own imagination. I would actually tend to agree with you just in terms of, of being a sociologist and thinking about interviewing people. Here we have a question from Gigi, who is also a bit of a groupie. She says, thank you, Tim, for being part of the lecture series. As a Radio 4 and more or less fangirl, I'm ridiculously happy to be in the virtual lecture. I'm wondering if you could comment on what, how education at all levels, but especially university level education, can do to help cultivate the openness to being disproven to others' reasons. So, I mean, what I would hope that uh, higher education in particular, but education at all levels is, is about being, you know, having your preconceptions uh, challenged and learning new things and finding new ways of, of seeing the world. Um, certainly how I remember my own uh, course in, I studied philosophy and economics um, and just constantly being, um, being challenged and being exposed to ideas that I you know, never thought of. Um, that's you know that's how it should be, um, and that's you know that's what what we always want. But there is always a there's always a risk that, um, and this is true for any academic discipline that it just starts to get um, narrow um, because people focus on the, you know their own interests. They focus professors focus on what got them to the top. Um, uh, journals, academic journals. Um, they tend not to change very quickly. So a lot of academic journals, the most prestigious ones are the ones that have been around the longest. So the one, obviously the ones that have been around the longest represent academic disciplines that were prominent in the late 1800s. And newer disciplines or interdisciplinary work, it's harder to get into the journals. So there are lots of, lots of forces putting us into silos or cutting off alternative points of view. Um, but we can, all, we can always push back. We live in a free society. Um, you know, amazing resources available on the internet, um, uh, uh, the, the library, any, even, even a small library has more books than you could possibly read in your lifetime. Um, and you know, Twitter, social media, it can be an echo chamber, but it can also be a great place to find people um, to, to engage with in an open-minded way. So um, for, for me, 
a lot of it comes down to our own desire. It's uncomfortable to encounter views that we disagree with. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes most of us uncomfortable. Um, but we have to push through that discomfort um, because, you know, that the sort of that growing pain is the sign of, you know, it's the signal that your brain is expanding and becoming more flexible and, and realizing the world is a little bit bigger than you previously imagined. Great, thank you. The next question is from Phil, who's a great fan of Cautionary Tales, your podcast. And he asks, how much of your lecture this evening was prepared? He says, to put this into context, are you a Ratner or Martin Luther King at his <laughs> best, or a bit of both? And which of these two approaches is most likely to make the audience accept your subject matter? So the just to explain to people who haven't listened to that particular episode of Cautionary Tales, it's about two uh, very famous speeches, uh, one given by the jewellery magnate Gerald Ratner, which ended his career, and uh, one given by the civil rights leader, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., um, which defined the civil rights movement. Uh, and it's about what went into the story behind those speeches and why some of the things we think about those two speeches, why they're wrong. Um, so question, how much did I prepare my remarks tonight? Well, uh, I mean, I've written a book uh, with a chapter on Van Meegeren and uh, I've presented a cautionary tales about Van Meegeren. And, you know, I've got some, I've got some notes here. Although you can see that, you know, just before the lecture, I thought, oh, hang on, I need to make some more notes. Um, but when I looked down this, I wasn't looking that much at the notes. And there's stuff in the notes that I didn't say, and there's stuff that was in a different order. So there's there's preparation, but there's also, I'm not reading from a script. Um, so that's how I do things. But I think an interesting question is, is the Q&A more interesting than the talk? Because of course the Q&A is always improvised because the Q&A is a, is a conversation because I don't know what the questions are going to be. So you can come to your own conclusions about that. That's, that's a really good point, actually. I always really enjoyed the, the Q&A. Uh, so Rafe is asking, as our reliance on digital technology grows, so too does the need for instant and easily digestible information. Is this going to help us understand the world better or is it going to polarise claims further? So the evidence that, uh, for example, the internet or social media is, is polarizing is uh, not, not clear. Uh, so one really interesting study uh, conducted by, um, uh, oh, well, in the, the name will come to me, um, by three basically statisticians. They looked at people's news consumption and um, how it changed depending on whether people were just typing in, say, bbc.co.uk or ft.com or dailymail.co.uk, whether they were typing in a URL or whether they were going via a search engine or whether people were accessing news via social media. And the question is, well, were things more polarised if they came to a news story via social media? And it turns out that the definition of polarisation is not completely straightforward. So there was a push towards the extremes. People who, who were kind of tended to be on the political right moved further right or consumed more uh, right wing stuff and people who were on the left consumed more left wing stuff. But there was also a bigger spread. So you were more likely to encounter uh, a completely contrary view or uh, uh, news from a totally different kind of source on social media, which I think might surprise people. But when you think about, well, what came before social media? Well, people would buy a newspaper like The Guardian or The Daily Mail, and um, you know, they'd just re read whatever the editor of The Guardian or the editor of The Daily Mail thought they should read. So when you think about it like that, yeah, there is actually potentially a spread, as well as this push towards the extremes in social media. The other thing that's really important in this study is that most people consume very little news at all. So people talk about the filter bubble or pushing us into the right wing and the left wing uh, ecosphere. But actually the biggest bubble is like people are not paying any attention at all. Um, and so that is the thing that worries me perhaps most of all. Um, I emphasize in my, uh, my podcast, my radio, 
my column, my books, our own motivation, our own curiosity. I said curiosity is the most important thing. Because ultimately, if you want to find out more about the world, if you want to see a range of views, if you want to really test your own logic, it's never been easier. It's never been easier to find really high quality information. At the same time, if you want to just put yourself in a bubble where you only ever see people who absolutely agree with you and will never challenge you, it's never been easier to do that either. So for me, it's not just about the techniques, the skills, the intelligence. It's about the curiosity. It's about the willingness. Um, I'm trying to encourage people to be more curious, to be more willing to bump into ideas they don't necessarily agree with and take them seriously and engage with them. Um, we can do it, but we have to want to do it. I'm just going to follow up on that because, you know, I'm struck by, and I think it comes back to your point about the power of our emotions, but more and more, I see the press appealing to our emotions more that it's, a, you know, it's, it's presenting a certain story to appeal to emotion rather that necessarily than giving statistics. So for example, before I came here, I lived in Belfast for many years. My son still lived there. So I followed the politics quite closely. And last week, a lot of the national press had stories about the um, about violence and backlash in Northern Ireland against the protocol. And when you dig this down, quite deeply, it was very localized and uh, a 15 year old and a 12 year old were reprimanded. But there is an emotional story that that is being presented. And given that people consume very little news and probably just read very little, it seems to me there is there is an increased need for responsible journalism. And I wonder if you have any comment on that. Well, I'm all in favour of responsible journalism. And, you know, that's what we all want, or certainly what I think most people want. Um, we, we also need, of course, responsible readers of journalism, because journalism takes place in a market. And there is that, this pressure to give people what they, what they want. And what they want is often very emotional stories. Um, so the one of the things I think that outraged a lot of journalists was when there was this outbreak of fake news in 2016, and there was a bit of a moral panic about it, was the fact that the fake news, which is basically just some kids in Bosnia making stuff up and selling advertising clicks, the fake news was more profitable than the real news. That was the thing that really got to journalists. That we, we, you know, we entered this business you know, to find out facts and tell people, but it turns out it's kind of expensive and time consuming to find out facts. If you just make any old stuff up, that doesn't take any time at all. And because it's so surprising and emotionally engaging, people click on it. That was the thing that really frustrated us. Yeah. So uh, in a way, but I don't think a lot of journalists' frustration with that situation um, was helpful, but at least it was encouraging. There was, there was still this sense of outrage. There is still this mission in journalism to tell people the truth. Um, so, yeah, well, absolutely. We journalists need to have high, the highest possible professional standards. At the same time, um, you know, you can write a great story full of facts and carefully report it. And if no one reads it, no one reads it. Yeah. Um, and you won't, be, you won't be in business for long. So that's our, that's our challenge. Thank you. OK, there are more questions, but I'm giving the very last question to John, because I think we've um, grilled you enough now. And he asks, uh, and it's something quite different. He's asking, do you have any thoughts on cyber currency in relation to all of this? He understands that Bitcoin reached a record high today. <laughs> Did it now. Excellent. So do I have thoughts on cyber currency? So <clears throat> um, cyber currency is, is interesting because you've got this fascinating technology, um, blockchain, um, and uh, and then you've got these currencies that people like to speculate on. Now, for me, I find blockchain very interesting. This is effectively a way of, I mean, I'm dramatically oversimplifying here, but it's a way of taking an Excel spreadsheet and kind of distributing it. So everyone is like, okay, what's in the spreadsheet? What does the spreadsheet say? Rather than saying, oh, that spreadsheet is owned by 
a company, say, you know, Visa or MasterCard or, or a big bank, um, you know, they, they, they know what's going on. Instead, you say, no, everyone's going to have to kind of agree what's going on in the spreadsheet. Um, so it's a decentralizing technology. Um, I, it's not clear to me what the applications of that are going to be, but I'm sure there will be really interesting ones. Um, but what that then implies for the price of Bitcoin or Dogecoin or Ethereum or, you know, whatever, I don't know. Um, there's, only, there's only a certain amount of Bitcoin, but you can always make more cryptocurrencies. So I've never really understood what drives the price. Um, and I've never bet on Bitcoin and I've never regretted not betting on Bitcoin. So don't come to an economist for advice on whether you should put your money in Dogecoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. Um, but I, I watch this space for really interesting applications of the underlying technology. Great. Tim Hartford, thank you very much for giving this evening's uh, public lecture and for the, the questions and answers se session. If you were here, you'd be hearing applause, so you'll just have to imagine it virtually. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And th thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And thanks for the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. So, and thank you to you, our audience, for listening. Um, before you go, I want to give you some details about our next event, which is um, next Tuesday, the 16th of November. And it's by Dr. Acker Hussein. It's the Jacobson Lecture. And the title of it is Leading the Fight Against Virus Spread, the Integrated COVID Hub Northeast. So I hope some of you might be able to join us uh, for that. and. Yeah, goodbye and good night from us and enjoy the rest of your evening.